Hello, I'm Hugh Miller. I used to teach at Nottingham Trent University, but I'm retired now. The last couple of years I've been coming up to Sheffield to give two lectures on the Peace and Conflict course on topics which I think are really important, uh, and I've enjoyed doing that. This year I'm stuck at home with a lockdown haircut, and neither you nor I are able to come to class. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about the haircut as well. Um, but I hope this, uh, this lecture will work for you reasonably well. I'd welcome comments and questions. You can contact me through Lisa Staniforth. The Psychology of Doing the Right Thing, Part 1 After World War II, and in particular the Holocaust, um, we developed a psychology to try and explain people's oppressive and cruel behaviour. Uh, with famous studies like The Authoritarian Personality and Milgram and Zimbardo's uh, Social Psychological Experiments. But there was another side. Even in situations like that, there were people who didn't behave in cruel and neglectful ways and people who actively did something to help. And that's what this lecture is about, trying to develop a psychology of doing the right thing. Uh, it's broken up into five videos. This is the introduction. Uh, the second and third 15 to 20 minutes each are a series of case studies. Uh, and then the fourth one, I'll go over uh, academic and psychometric studies uh, to try and sort out um, environmental and personality issues involved in people who help. Um, and in the final session, I'll go back with more anecdotal interpretations of the case studies and what I think um, they mean, and of course, a final summary. So there's more to human behaviour in crisis than the cruel and neglectful. And even in uh, famous studies in which people do behave cruelly, uh, not everybody does that. Uh, see the behaviour of this person uh, in Milgram's uh, obedience experiment. 150 volts. Oh. Sad face. Wait a minute. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Continue. My heart's starting Continue. to bother Continue. me. I refuse to go on. Let me out. I, I think we ought to find out what's wrong in there first. The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Well, the experiment might require that we continue, but I still think we should find out what the condition of the gentleman is. As I said before, although the shocks may be painful, they're not dangerous. Look, I don't know anything about electricity. I don't profess any knowledge, nor will I go any further until I find out if the guy's okay. It's absolutely essential that you continue. Well, essential or not, this program isn't quite that important to me that I should go along doing something that I know nothing about, particularly if it's going to injure someone. I don't know what this is all about. Well, whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until he's learned all the word pairs correctly. Well, uh, you can sure have your 450 back. I didn't want it anyhow. I intend to give it to some charitable organization, but I wouldn't go on with it. The 450 is not the uh, issue here. That check is yours simply yeah, going to the lab. Uh, it is essential that you continue the experiment. No, it isn't essential. Not one bit. You have no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. It's worth remembering, although that it was shocking that two thirds of the people uh, obeyed the instructions and went to the highest level of shock, a third of the people in this condition refused. And uh, over the range of Milgram studies, generally the obedience level was lower than that, and in some conditions very much lower than that. Milgram was interested in uh, the people who refused and tried to work out what they were like, what was going on, and on the whole didn't succeed. I'll tell you later on about what he said about that. But um, more recently, people have gone back to review the transcripts and records from that study and come up with a, a couple of points about refusers. Gibson uh, did a rhetorical analysis. Milgram's techniques were rhetorical, the pressure was all verbal, uh, there's no alternative, you have no other choice, it's absolutely essential, and so on. Um, and uh, Gibson pointed out that um, some people were able to talk back to that uh, and to uh, redefine the discourse uh, in terms of um, 
the kind of things that the man you've just seen did uh, in a process of negotiation which led to quite radical departures from the standardized experimental procedure that is they refused uh, Modigliani and Rochat um, looked at timing. Milgram's technique was to sucker people in stage by stage. They start with doing something perfectly innocent and it gradually gets worse and worse and worse. Um, Modigliani and Rochat point out that those people who started to object early on in the process were those who were more likely to end up defiant. In fact, most people who uh, dropped out did it at the point that you've just seen where the, uh, the fake learner says that he doesn't want to go on. Uh, and I think it's important that people who caught on quickly to what was happening and the problems of what was happening are the people who were more likely uh, to resist when it came to the crunch. Now this century, uh, people have started to uh, think that we should develop more ideas about this and uh, Philip Zimbardo uh, was quite important in getting this going uh, and here he is talking uh, in 2012 about uh, how his ideas developed. Okay, I gave a talk at TED uh, I think 2007 uh, in which I talked about this, my journey from evil to heroism and, and it was just an idea in the last five minutes I talked about um, how easy it is to get good people to do bad things. That in, in all the research that we've done and, and many, many other people have done, uh, within an hour you get the majority of people to do almost anything by, by applying various social psychological tactics. Uh, you know, the equivalent of the, um, the mystical elixir in, that Dr. Jekyll did to transform himself into Mr. Hyde. And the question I raise is, what would it take to make an ordinary person engage in heroic deeds? And I said, I want really, I want to make that my mission in life to give up being Dr. Evil, who looks this way and, and did all that research, to being the good witch of the West, at least of the West Coast. Uh, and so after that talk, hundreds of people came up. First, I got a standing ovation at TED, which is relatively rare. And hundreds of people came up and said, oh my God, you have to expand on this. It's a, such a good idea. You have to... Um, uh, scale it up, you have to logoize it. I mean, all these terms I didn't know anything about. So I began to think more seriously about it. Uh, and then we had a little conference at Stanford exploring this notion with educators and some entrepreneurs, some um, people in, co in communications. And everybody agreed, this is something worth studying. Namely, what does it take to be a hero? What, is, what, what, is, what does it mean to be a hero these days? And then lastly is that uh, and so two years ago at, uh, in San Francisco, I founded the Heroic Imagination Project, which is uh, uh, a program uh, focused on creating a social revolution around the world, of getting people around the world, especially young people, think of themselves as heroes in training, you know, so that when the, situ when the situation presents itself, where they have to intervene on behalf of others or to defend them all cause, they'll be ready to do so. Um, and so, so that's where we are now. We, we have this small group, um, small staff. We're doing research, uh, education, and corporate development. Okay, so the word being used here is heroes. And when I first started doing these talks, um, that was the title that I gave it. I've since come to think that that's probably not the best title. Uh, heroes are wonderful people, uh, not like you and me. Uh, and the real issue is more small scale everyday acts of um, defiance or, or support. Nonetheless, uh, it's a powerful term. And um, you see that uh, Zim Zimbardo is running the Heroic Im Imagination Project. There is now a heroism science journal, which I'll give you a reference to. Um, and uh, a lot of the papers that you might read uh, will use the word uh, hero. So it's, um, it's a useful search term for you uh, and it's a, a term which will come up repeatedly uh, in the rest of this lecture. Uh, and certainly some of the examples I will give um, are hero. Zimbardo and um, his, uh, his, his co-workers uh, started out by trying to develop a, a typology of heroes. 
uh, initially just out of their own ideas. And um, And this is what they came up with. First of all, they made a distinction between uh, physical peril and uh, social peril. Uh, and physical peril, it's a matter of danger to life and limb. Um, and this could be uh, military, but also in particular, civilian occupations like firefighter uh, and paramedic uh, might be uh, examples of that kind of hero. Uh, and then there's a range of um, social heroes, people who uh, will f are facing loss and danger, maybe not so much in the physical sense, but uh, financial, reputational, uh, loss of freedom, uh, and, and so on. Um, the, the Christian idea of the Good Samaritan, the person who stops to help um, someone who is in distress uh, is one example. People who work within uh, the system, who use what power they may have within the structure to help others, uh, bureaucracy heroes. Um, whistleblowers, people who uh, stand up from within an oppressive system and uh, alert others to what's going on, um, reveal the problems that exist. Uh, and people you could call social activists who are just working uh, and organising uh, in whatever way they can uh, to uh, improve things, to help people, to save people. Uh, they also pointed out that there's another category of people that you might call heroes, people who um, overcome uh, great obstacles, people who succeed in the face of adversity, um, adventurers, underdogs, uh, political leaders, and, and so on. And, and although I think it's reasonable to say that you know these are heroic figures, it's a different kind of heroism from that which is directly helping other people. They tested out this um, typology on the general public by drawing up a series of case studies, uh, showing them to people and asking them to rate uh, what was described as being either heroic or altruistic or not showing heroism nor altruism. Uh, and uh, what they found was general support. Most of um, the, the people on the first uh, slide that I showed you uh, were seen as, as being heroic, but there was a marked difference that those people who were showing uh, physical courage in the, in the face of physical risk were more likely to be seen as heroic. Um, social heroes were more likely to be seen as being uh, altruistic um, and in some cases uh, not so much heroic or altruistic, but just people doing good work. Um, but overall, um, the kind of thing that um, Franco et al. thought was heroic, the general public did as well. They pointed out that um, to be heroic, you have to do something with no real justification. Uh, generally, in fact, it's something which is going to cost you that you're going to suffer for. Um, that uh, if there is a, a good reason for your doing something, financial or social or whatever for yourself, this may still be a good thing to do, but it's not seen as being uh, the action of a hero. It's also worth pointing out that it does depend on success. Um, if you uh, take great risks, you may end up as a hero. You may also just end up as another casualty. Um, and uh, in if you're not on the winning side, um, you're not likely to be seen as a hero. A number of the examples I'll show you, um, people's heroic behaviour was only recognised as such 20 years afterwards when the social or political war climate had changed. Uh, what they did at the time was often seen as being a bad thing um, and maybe even a, a, a traitorous thing. Uh, so and if you do something and uh, you're on the losing side, um, you may be a villain rather than a hero. Um, so here's Zimbardo talking about some more aspects of the classification and uh, what that means for him. For me, there are essentially three ca categories of heroes. There is the impulsive, reactive hero, the person who, who uh, perceives an emergency and responds immediately, where 
minutes or seconds make the difference between life and death of someone. And we had the, the prime example a few years ago in New York of this um, uh, Wesley Autry, African-American, 50-year-old man who's on the subway, and a man falls across the track, and instantly he has two little children. He, he asks the stranger to take care of them, jumps on the track, and saves the man by putting him between the tracks and pressing himself down on top of him. And there was literally a half an inch between the top of his head and the bottom of the, the subway car, which would have decapitated him had it been an inch lower. And so that's the classic example of the reactive, impulsive hero, uh, you know, who in, his, in, in an instant has to make uh, a life-threatening decision. And in fact, most people don't. So it, that's really rare. Because at that time, on the subway station, there were at least 75 people who simply froze. The, the second kind of hero is what I would call reflective, proactive. These are the whistleblowers. They see a fraud, they see some deceit, they see some deception, they see something immoral, and they have to often collect sufficient data to present it to authorities. They often have to get people so, to support them, other people on their side. And so it takes time, it's not, it's not of this instant quality, but again, as with the first kind of hero, you do it aware of the personal cost and risk. So the way heroism is differentiated from altruism is that dimension. It's, it's, uh, there is a cost to being a hero where, where there's not to being altruistic. If you're altruistic, you give money to, give money to church, you give a pint of blood you know, every now and then to Red Cross. It's really minimal cost. To be a whistleblower, you could lose your job, you could not get promoted. Um, and to be, and to the other kind of hero, or in some cases, like in in China and Russia, you get put in prison. Um, and and to be the other kind of hero, you could often lose your life. Uh, what you just mentioned is really a third kind of hero, which is someone who his whole life, whose whole life, is focused on a cause. Uh, and I guess M Nelson Mandela would be a model of that, or Martin Luther King, and Mother Teresa. Uh, so these are people who, whose heroism is not in any single act, but it's really a, a lifestyle of, make, of dedicating their life to a cause, to a, a, a principle. And, and they, are, they are relatively rare, but again, they, they are role models for us to, to, be, to begin to emulate. Um, so, so I would see those as three kinds of heroes. Now, if you ask me, well, what's the difference between them in terms of the psychology, the answer is we don't have a clue. There is no basic research as simple as even what's the difference between a reactive hero and an impulsive hero. There's got to be a personality difference. Nobody has asked or tried to answer that question. And the most amazing thing to me as I've started doing research on heroism, and in, I wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil, and the last chapter is on celebrating heroism, and there was very little I could put into that chapter because I did a literature search and there's almost no current research on heroism. The, most, the, the biggest body of research on heroism, heroism are interviews with Christians who helped Jews in the Holocaust. Okay. So this is a complicated area. Uh, we've got different kinds of people probably doing different kinds of things in different kinds of circumstances and, and with different time co courses. Um, so the, the immediate impulsive hero is obviously different from somebody who, even in the physical sense, is putting themselves in danger over days or weeks or, or years. Um, and um, there's also a difference in the kind of risk involved. Some things, um, you're, you'll either be killed or you're not. Uh, and once the danger has passed, thing, things will be fine. Uh, in other times, you may be putting yourself in the, the, the chance of long-term harm. Uh, and also, I think you can make a distinction between risks and costs. Uh, some things might turn out badly or they might not, and you might be all right. Uh, other things are bound to turn out badly. This is what I mean by costs. You know that if you follow this action, there will be a loss. A loss of reputation, a loss of income, a loss of liberty, uh, or whatever. Um, and um, that's pretty certain. It's not a risk, uh, it's a cost. So 
there's a lot going on here. It's quite complicated. Uh, it's going to be impossible to make simple statements about what's going to happen. Um, and I'm going to move on in the next two sections to uh, some case studies. Uh, and you'll see a whole range of different issues and different aspects coming out of that.